Our first speaker is going to speak to us uh, about uh, speaking to the elderly with early dementia. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Hilary Beaver, who is the Blanton Eye I uh, Institute, who is, excuse me, who is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the Blanton Eye Institute at Houston Methodist Hospital, as well as uh, uh, the Cornell Wheel uh, Medical School. And she is also Adjunct Associate Professor at UT, uh, University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston. Uh, and uh, again, she will speak to us about the elderly patients with early dementia. Thank you, Dr. Beaver. Thank you. So this is a ever increasing group of patients, so it's a good one to get comfortable learning how to sit down and talk with. I have no financial disclosures of interest and um, there's no off-label usage. My objectives are at the end of this that you should be able to differentiate between mild cognitive impairment and dementia and to be able to recognize the components of early cognitive loss and recognize how it affects communication. It affects both how the patient receives your communication and how they're able to formulate a response to you and deliver communication back. You will be exercising your communication competency. You already know what to say. You do that with every other patient. We just need in this group of people to know how to say it and who else to include in the conversation. So mild cognitive impairment is early cognitive loss. It involves short-term memory and executive function. It's a loss that's greater than expected by age, and it's noticeable, but mostly it's noticeable to people who know that patient. It is measurable. Neurologists will do special tests looking for this and be able to quantify, and they like to see these patients back on a every six to 12 months basis. These patients have an increased dementia risk. They have a 10 to 15% per year conversion to dementia as compared to one to 3% per year for the average 65 and older population. This means that in seven years, 80% of these people will have dementia. There are risk factors, age, vasculopathic risk factors, and a family history of dementia. And in this population, it's about 15 to 20% of those who are age 65 and older. This contrasts with dementia, which has cognitive loss, both memory and thinking skills, which affects daily functions, so your activities of daily living. It's actually a group of diseases, it's not just one disease, and of course number one in that group is Alzheimer's, which accounts for about 60 to 80 percent of dementia. Number two in this group would be Parkinson's. It involves five core mental functions, and for dementia you need to have significant impairment in two of these. And really, we use all five of these in an eye exam, sitting down, examining the patient, talking to them, having them receive our message, and then go and do what it is we're recommending, which is memory, communication and language, the ability to focus and pay attention, reasoning and judgment, and visual perception. These patients have insight, and they're scared. They know they have memory difficulty. They start bringing people with them, families and friends, and have them write down your instructions to review later. Often they'll report that they have self-limited activities, such as driving. And really what their fear is, is a fear of Alzheimer's, because they have seen other family members and family and uh, friends who have gone through Alzheimer's disease. So one of the first things you want to do is to identify a care partner. If they seem to be having difficulty, you can broach this topic with them and they'll understand and have them bring a family or friend with them to help them because they can't be paying attention and writing things down themselves at the same time. You want to get a HIPAA release early on for this family or friend because they will call you back and ask you more questions. And if they're not on your list of releases, you have to actually ask to speak to the patient. You want to triangulate your discussion. Don't just talk to the caregiver. You want to be talking to the patient, but you want to include the caregiver. So if you're person B and the patient is person A, make the caregiver person C. So you're sitting in a triangular pattern looking back and forth between them. That will also cause them to look back and forth between each other, and all of you are getting involved in the discussion. It reinforces your instructions to both of them so that they can both remember. It also helps the patient maintain respect and makes them feel valued, and it decreases their sense of isolation, which comes along with having cognitive impairment. This patient can then assist the patient with tasks, follow-up care activities, and coming back for their next appointment. Be compassionate with these people. 
They are frustrated just as much as you are frustrated. They are having to live with their lack of communication with others. This is part of the disease process. They have trouble processing what you're telling them. It takes them longer to receive it and to think about it and then to formulate their own response. So you have to take time and let them formulate their response and just wait. They're afraid, and that's also affecting their ability to interact with you at the moment. They live in a state of mild confusion, anxiety, and uncertainty, and being in your office is making that worse. And they know many of them are gonna worsen, and they're afraid of that. They will have good days and bad days, and it's okay to acknowledge that with them. And if they respond that they have certain times of days that are better, tell your front desk to schedule accordingly to help them out. Be respectful of them. They actually know what they wanna say, they're just having trouble formulating a response. So slow down and wait for them to respond. Speak clearly, and remember, in these cases, it's actually better to have multiple short, small visits to, re to review one thing at a time, which is really all that they can handle, and avoid one great big, long, complex, multitasking visit. Use your nonverbal cues. They're using theirs. They can read you. You should sit down and read them. Look at their facial expression, their body posture, and you want to make sure that you yourself are internally consistent so that your body language and your facial expression and your delivery of what you're saying doesn't confuse them. You wanna use slow, gentle movements, smile at the patient, and sit down looking face to face and eye to eye with them. Do not stand above the patient looking down because that's perceived as being threatening and that may accelerate the patient into bad behaviors that they can't control. You wanna respect their personal space, Remember that one of our major nonverbal cues is pictures, and if you use a picture, they may be able to take it home. You, you could also write down and have take home instructions. Human touch can be reassuring as well. Remember to be an active listener. So if they say something and you're confused, ask them to repeat themselves. If you're still confused, you wanna repeat back to them what they said uh, to, so that they can clarify. And when you're asking them questions, make them simple questions, yes, no questions. Do not ask them multiple choice branching questions or open-ended questions because they'll get lost in the response. Minimize distractions that are going on while you're having your meeting. Have an enclosed space. The iClinic is actually very good for this. Shut the door, limit external stimuli, try not to have the technicians interrupt you because this will mentally tax the patient and ask them when they're giving themselves medication, uh, doing their self-care, that they do the same thing. Have them close the curtains, turn off the television, turn off uh, music because it will distract them and they may not complete the task that they're doing. Position yourself so that you can get the patient's full attention. So again, sit down, be face to face. Don't start until they're looking at you, look eye to eye. Turn the lights on. We tend to keep the lights down in the eye clinic, but you want to have good lighting because a lot of these patients have uh, hearing loss to some degree as well, and they may be spending some time lip reading. So don't do this with your back to the patient. Announce what you're gonna do before you do it so you don't startle them. Try to look open and relaxed. And if you're having a bad day or a stressful clinic and you see a name that you know is a patient that has this problem, you need to de-stress yourself before you enter that room because they can pick up on those nonverbal cues. Use proper nouns, go in and greet them by their name and introduce yourself by your own name and tell them who you are in relation to them and what it is you're about to do. Don't use pronouns when referring to other people, such as those who are gonna be helping to take care of them, because remember that dementia creates the penultimate indefinite antecedent. They're not gonna be able to follow your train of thought and know who you're talking about. Recognize that this kind of communication is a learned skill and you're gonna get better at doing it the more you do it. If you sit down and they look confused when you try to speak with them, repeat yourself. Say the same thing and give them time. If they still seem confused, then rephrase yourself. And you can read their body language again, looking at their nonverbal cues to be able to gauge their understanding. And sometimes they'll be able to express themselves better with nonverbal cues than with verbal uh, speech. And it's okay to suggest words when they're trying to speak, but let them try first. When you give instructions, make them concise. Break down a complex task into a series of simple steps. It helps to write it down and number it. 
And if you feel like you're time pressured, just tell them what it is you need to say, but that you're gonna send them a letter afterwards, which will have this summarized, and you can turn parts of that letter into a handout because you're gonna be running into similar problems with other patients. It helps to use your sense of humor and laugh with them. This is just the penultimate nonverbal cue of saying, I understand you, I like you, I acknowledge you, and it will put them at ease so that they can interact with you. Finally, just take the time to communicate. Research has proven benefits to communication. They're more likely to adhere to their treatment. They have better outcomes and greater satisfaction and less lawsuits. And it helps the patient preserve their individuality and their personal identity. So in summary, you should now understand what the difference is between mild cognitive impairment and dementia and be able to recognize the components of early cognitive loss, recognize how it affects their communication with you, and you should be able to tailor your interaction with the patient, not just what to say, but how to say it and who else to include in the conversation. There's many resources that are available, both through Alzheimer's associations, Caregivers Alliance, uh, the American Geriatric Society, and the uh, federal government, and I thank you for your time and attention.